Well, good to have everybody back this evening. I'd like to uh, remind you of a few things we were talking about this morning, and then we'll press ahead. This morning we spent some time in Matthew 13 as the Lord was teaching in parables, and his disciples asked him why he taught in parables. We talked about the fact that parables, in, in our minds, often we think of parables as um, the, a way that the Lord used to make uh, difficult things simple so that everyone could understand but we find in truth that the parables Christ said he used uh, so that those who heard wouldn't understand but those who do understand that their understanding would be deepened and enriched so this this is a another example of the Lord and his word uh, dividing right and really parsing between the two groups of the believing and unbelieving and he tells the, uh, the people there as he's talking to them, as he's talking to his disciples about this uh, method of teaching and the fulfillment of the prophet Isaiah in these people, that uh, they would be uh, the fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah of that generation that had eyes and saw not and ears and heard not, uh, and neither did they understand. We talked about how in Psalm 135, the Lord tells us that it's his judgment uh, that those who choose to worship idols uh, be made like unto them. And so all through the Old Testament, we have the idea of the idol, which is dumb and can't speak, it can't hear, it can't understand, it can't see. And that is spoken time and again to the children of Israel. So when the, the Lord is talking about these are people who cannot see, who cannot hear, uh, he's likening them to the object of their worship. And that's really important for us to understand as we think about this topic of worship in our time today. So we spent this morning uh, talking a little bit about worship and concluded with the statement of the Lord Jesus Christ that the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And so there is a battle of worship uh, that's been waging on this earth for thousands of years. Uh, and the battle, as we see the last days approaching, the battle for worship is intensifying. And we can expect that to continue. The true worshipers of God can certainly expect from what we know from Scripture, and we're going to look at a few of these things tonight, that the battle for worship on this earth is going to greatly intensify as the years go by and this age draws to a close. Uh, so that's one of the, the threads that runs all through Scripture that we see the conclusion of the matter in the book of Revelation. And there's a lot of those kind of things in the book of Revelation. Worship is one of them. I want to talk uh, just briefly, if you'll turn to Hebrews chapter number 12. Before we get into that aspect uh, of worship, I want to turn to Hebrews chapter number 12 and talk a little bit about uh, the assembly uh, that we are uh, gathered into as we gather unto Christ. We were talking about um, some of these aspects this morning, but didn't go into great detail. But it's important for us to remember, as we talked about this morning, if we understand the who of worship just like the lord at the with the woman at the well he tried to redirect her thinking from the where is the right place to worship back to the who are we worshiping if we'll start with the who and keep the who in mind and understand uh, the holiness and the righteousness and the majesty of the one that we are worshiping all the other questions about where and when and how to worship will begin to answer themselves uh, as we study the word and as we observe the character of God. I think of Isaiah in the Old Testament as he gets a glimpse of God on his throne. I don't think the question of how to worship was as much of a question for Isaiah after he gets a glimpse of God on his throne in heaven, right? The, a lot of the questions we wrestle with of ours, how and all these kind of things, which are good questions to wrestle with, there are, as we talked about this morning, appropriate uh, ways to worship God and inappropriate ways to worship God. But ultimately, the modern idea of worship is a bit of a departure from what we see in Scripture. And you can't get a full understanding of what the word worship even is conveying by just, uh, this is one of those words that you have to look at how it's used in context. The definition of the word itself does not speak to the entirety of what is involved with worship. The, wor the word worship uh, literally just means to bow down. To, to basically show reverence to someone uh, to who, who is in a higher position of rank or authority than you are, right? And, but yet the word itself, when it's used in context, goes 
beyond simply the act of, you know, in our body, getting down on our, on our knees and, you know, doing worship. In the uh, you know, Middle East cultures, it's the idea of touching the forehead to the ground. And so when we think about worship, that observance of worship is present in Scripture. We see people in the Old Testament that that was an aspect of worship, right, to physically act out the representation of the spiritual reality. But the physical act of getting on your knees and bowing your head to the ground is not worship of God if the spirit is not worshiping God, right? So the representation and the physical act is useful insofar as it represents and teaches us of the truth of the spiritual reality that it's supposed to correlate to. Uh, it's the same with really any thing that we have been commanded to observe in the flesh, that there's no righteousness to be had for us in the physical observance of, the, of any of these ordinances or commandments we're given, and yet neither are we uh, blameless if we neglect them or let them fall into misuse or, or, or lack of use or uh, neglect or if they become defiled with false teaching and other things, then we're not blameless in that because they have been committed to us for a reason. I was talking this afternoon uh, a little bit with someone about the Lord's Supper. You know, that's something we observe as a church, but largely the observance manifests itself in the physical activity that, it, that takes place around that observance, right? So we have uh, the unleavened bread that we prepare. We have the, the juice, the uh, grape juice that we use that comes from the vine and these elements that we use on the Lord's Supper and we all partake of them, right? So they're all poured out and come from the same place, right? The same bread, in other words, is in all of us uh, and the same uh, wine is in all of us, as it were, because it's all poured out the same. Well, we may share a cup these days, uh, but it's poured out to everyone from the same. And so those things all signify things. So they have to be observed in a real particular way. Otherwise, they no longer signify what they're intended to portray. What I find a lot of times today is people um, struggling and arguing about the physical observance of it, but without the understanding that is supposed to be given through the observance of it. So we can never really quite figure out the how if we don't understand some of the other pieces. Well, worship is kind of the same. That we have to worship God in truth, right? In other words, there is the things that are consecrated by Christ as the body of doctrine that teach us how to worship him, right? So that's truth. However, just observing those physical things in and of themselves is of very little value if we don't come to him in a spirit that has been quickened uh, by faith in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. All of that's kind of introductory. But I want to say from Hebrews chapter number 12, if we begin reading in verse number 22, that the Apostle Paul is drawing a parallel for us to look at uh, some comparisons between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And in verse number 22, he's comparing uh, to the, the mountain that they came to, Mount Sinai, in the wilderness that they came unto. And it was, uh, you know, well, we can just read it. Why don't we just do that? For you're not coming to that mount that might be touched. In other words, what's he saying? That physical mountain, that place that was designated that they come and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore, for they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with the dark. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. All right, so this is the old covenant. The old covenant that was given to teach and instruct the children of Israel of sin and their need of a redeemer, right? And so this was uh, living under that law. The only thing you could know through that law was two things, condemnation and the hope that you could have through the promise of a coming redeemer who would shed his blood to fulfill the word of God to save his people from their sins. But the law continually condemned you, right? You would bring a sacrifice because of what you just did, because what you just did was wrong. So imagine if church worked this way, our service would be a lot longer, 
if every person came every week and had to offer sacrifices and do all the things that were necessary to be cleansed from the sin that you had transgressed against the Lord the previous week. All right, so we need an extra, you know, six, eight hours just to, before we get into the service for everybody that's a member of the congregation to go through the process. Well, this was the old covenant. You were never, uh, your conscience was never purged of sin. You were only reminded of your sin, right? And put in remembrance of the promise of God that gave you some hope, right? So these things were observed. And of course, that's a fearful way to live, right? I mean, that's the whole point of uh, this is that if we're expecting to approach God in our righteousness uh, and appease his justice, that's a foolish hope. Right? That's what the Old Covenant teaches us, and that's what this represents. That for us, I mean, even the people knew, uh, I can't approach. I don't even want to approach. They got just a glimpse of the glory of God. And so they said, hey, Moses, why don't you go talk to God and come back and tell us what he says, and we'll do everything he says, uh, which, of course, was an exaggeration on their part. But notice the contrast here in verse number 22, but, right? So now we're... we're uh, going to the opposite of what has just been laid out. It says, But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. He's going on to correspond all of the things that we have come to by faith. And what he's explaining is, I think, similar, very, very similar to what we see in the book of Ephesians when he's talking about how we've been seated in heavenly places with Christ. Right? The corresponding heavenly reality that is represented by those who have come to Christ as we gather together each week. You say, well, preacher, what's your point in all of that? My point in all of that is simply this, that when we gather together to worship God, there ought to be a, a, a real honest and sincere, in other words, a pure heart with the way we think about how we come into the presence of Christ. Right? In other words... When we gather together in the presence of Christ, none of us uh, are here by ourselves. Paul talks about the angels who are beholding the things that are taking place. The Lord speaks about his presence being with us in the midst of our assembly. Uh, and he obviously with the churches in Revelation, as he's writing to those seven churches, he says over and over again, I know. Right? I know. So what does Jesus Christ, if he were to write an epistle to this congregation, you know what he would say? He would say, I know. I see. I'm present. I'm with you. Right? So whenever we are gathered together, partaking of the service, whether it's singing of the hymns, or whether we're... Uh, you know, blessed enough to participate in the playing of an instrument of some kind in the, in the worship of God and the praise of God. If we're involved to, to be able to uh, lead the congregation in prayer, whatever the case may be, as we're all participating in the worship of God together in the assembly, that this is the reality we're supposed to be mindful of. Psalm 95 says it very well. It says, Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Right? What is, what is the psalmist uh, calling the people to do? He's talking to them about coming into the house of God. Right? He's, he's inviting them. Oh, come, let us. Right? So this is a participatory congregational uh, activity. Right? So there is an aspect of worship that is personal, but there is an aspect that is what we call corporate, which means the whole body together. Right? So if you work for a corporation, then you are an employee or a member of that body. It's a, it's a body that is joined together 
uh, with a common purpose of some kind to do business, right? Well, we are corporately the body, and that's taken from the word uh, corpus, which you know, of course, uh, means body in Latin. So the corporate body that comes together, that is uh, in covenant of faith and mutual uh, faith in Christ. So we're in this fellowship together to worship Jesus Christ, right? And to worship the Father by Him. So when we think about that, the psalmist is inviting, come, let us sing, right? This is, a, this is an opportunity that he's extending to those who want to praise the name of God. Come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. In other words, act like there's something you've been delivered from. Amen. And think about that and hold it in mind as you lift up the name of the one who did the delivering. Think about the wrath of God and the eternal damnation from which you have been spared. By the death of Jesus Christ and the offering of himself. And as you contemplate that truth and that horrible fate that you deserve, that you were spared, think about that and hold it in view as you lift up your voice in praise and sing the louder and sing the bolder and sing the more enthusiastically because there's a great deliverance been wrought and you've been made a partaker of it through faith in Christ. And there is a reason to sing. That's what the psalmist uh, is saying. Let us come before what? His presence. His house is the place where he has put his name and his presence. And that's what this church is today. That this is the house of God. That he dwells here. That he has built it for himself. And so as we come together, be mindful of the things that are taking place here. That these are not simply earthly temporal observances but rather they are truly heavenly things themselves and while we can't at this time strip away and understand the entirety of everything we're called to observe uh, that we see kind of through a glass dimly nonetheless the reality of our experience in the congregation of Christ in the time to come will not be much different that there will be specific, specific times when we are invited to come into the presence of the King and to gather around the throne of God and to partake in His worship. We see that all through the book of Revelation, that the people are gathered around the throne. And what are they doing? They're worshiping God. right? So we gather around now. And what is present? If this is the house of God, His presence is among us. And certainly, uh, if you look at the Old Testament pictures and types of the tabernacle and the temple, we clearly understand as a priesthood of believers that we gather into that holy place and the holiest place being Christ himself, that right now the veil we can't quite see through beyond that. There are some spiritual applications of those pictures where we come in and we break the bread and we have fellowship. We have the altar of incense where we pray because we're the body and the body prays to the head, right? And the head gives commands to the body. We understand all these things and what they speak to us. But we need to understand when we cross over the threshold, so to speak, coming out of the world and coming into the assembly, that what is taking place here is a heavenly thing. It's more than just the physical stuff we do. It's more than whether or not there's enough water in the water cooler. It's more than whether or not there's enough tissues in my pew. It's more than whether or not things are a little out of sorts. What is happening is the body of Christ is getting together to praise and to worship and to celebrate and enjoy the presence of the one who is their redeemer. Right, So all through the New Testament, we see these truths shared with us that we are to understand when we gather unto Christ out of the world. Right, We go out into the world uh, as ambassadors. We go out into the world uh, to live the lives he's given us to live in the flesh now. But when we assemble together, just like in the Old Testament, what happened when they assembled the tabernacle? The presence of God would fill that place. There is something to be said today for a place and a time. There's a place and there's a time where God has said, I will meet with my people in a special way. 
right? And that happens when we gather together unto him as a body, and we see it all through uh, the scriptures and especially in the New Testament. So these things need to be understood. When we're coming in here, uh, it's not necessarily for us to have fun, although I think if you have the spirit, you will be delighted. But there's a difference. Some people, and that's why I said this morning, the, the front lines on this battle of worship today is happening with churches who are reconstructing the service to make it appeal to people who don't believe the gospel. So now I've constructed a church service, which is supposed to be an act of holy worship of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the Father by Him. Now I've reconstructed what worship is to make it appeal to the lost and the unbelieving, which is never what the intent of the gathering of the saints was ever to be. It's wonderful that the gospel is preached here, and it is an opportunity for those who don't yet understand the truth to be brought to Christ uh, in believing faith. But the purpose and intent of this assembly is not evangelism. It's the edification of the body. And so we have to always hold the head. Right? We are gathered here today because we have been joined together uh, by the work of God's Spirit in our hearts through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's that faith that knits us together in unity to worship and honor Him. So as we hold the head, right, then He ministers to the body. But the moment that the body makes it about the body, you can forget about it. That's right. right? That's, it's a complete corruption of the design and intent of of creation right the the body does not exist for the body the body exists for the head and it must always be that way the body only exists for the head and christ is the head of our body the church and so we must always hold his will and his uh, the things he delights in in the highest regard and not corrupt and defile the worship of god to please the world. Uh, of course, the world is very pleased when we take that approach. I would like you to turn to the book of Revelation quickly, as quickly as you can without tearing pages. I mean, when I say quickly, I just mean, you know, you don't have to panic. But. Book of Revelation. I want you to, as best you can, kind of hold in your hands Everything we talked about this morning and the brief introduction this evening that I've just given, I'm going to walk you through a few verses in the book of Revelation. I want you to see uh, what uh, everything that God does is full of purpose, full of purpose. And even his judgments in the book of Revelation are aimed at a purpose. I want you to notice this uh, in verse number 20. So this is after the sixth trumpet. So there's been... Uh, the seals opened. Uh, there's been the trumpets taking place. Uh, we're not quite to the seventh. But he says uh, in verse number 20, And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet, what? Repented not of the works of their hands. Okay, so what did we talk about this morning? What, did, what is the problem? That men, yes. Revelation 9. That was extra credit. You were just supposed to, if you could figure it out, if you could figure it out, you get extra credit. No extra credit today. Sorry. That was a test. Revelation 9, 20. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet, what? Repented not of the works of their hands. What is the tendency of mankind? To worship the work of their own hands. Right? It is just uh, as natural as the day is long. So this is what he's saying. They repented not of the works of the hands that they should not, what? Worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can, what? See nor hear nor walk. So what is the aim of the plagues? To demonstrate to men that their 
stuff cannot save them. God, remember that what God did in Egypt when he clearly demonstrated his power through each of the ten plagues over specific gods that the Egyptians worshipped to demonstrate that those gods have no power. That the Lord God, that he is God. Right? And so what do we have in the book of Revelation? We have something very similar. Only men have progressed in their thinking. Right? We've moved past the, um, you know, the silly idea that there is a being somewhere that we can represent with an image. And we've just gone directly to worshiping the stuff itself. Right? Not the one who can give us the stuff. All through history, men have worshipped gods who could do something for them in this life. Right? Someone, a God who can uh, give fertility, a God who can give wealth, a God who can make your crops grow, a God who can, you know, give well-being to your family, a God who can keep you safe at sea, right? I mean, all through history, that's how people thought of these false gods, that they were able to do something for me, and so I'll appease them and make them happy, and then I'll be safe at sea, and my crops will come in, and everything else. This is how they thought. Now, We've moved past that because we're so enlightened that we know there's no supreme being anywhere. Uh, but in our own understanding and in our own knowledge, we now have come full circle where we understand that the material things themselves, that's where our hope really lies, right? Because we're so enlightened now and we've learned so much. So we've given up all the foolish religion of former days gone by. We're not, we don't make temples anymore. We don't do all that. It's so interesting to me that most of that changed in history in a timeline that corresponds directly with the coming and appearing of Jesus Christ. Why is it that back in the Old Testament that whenever there was uh, the tabernacle and the temple and all these things, uh, that all of that was pervasive throughout the world as well. And then you get to Jesus Christ, and moving forward from there, all of a sudden, it's like the whole world has almost kind of given up on that approach to religion. Um, it's much more mysticism, this kind of ethereal stuff, whatever. It's just interesting to me. Nonetheless, the point of the plagues is a matter of worship, that men hold their own works in the highest regard. And they're putting their hope and their confidence and their trust in their own works, in their own hands. So let's follow this through and get to Revelation 13. Because Revelation 13, and again, I'm just trying to, to sew together this theme in your mind so that you can see from a scriptural standpoint, from the very beginning to the end, this is what's been at play ever since the time of Cain and Abel. Right? What did we have in Cain and Abel? We had a true worshiper and a false worshiper, right? So from the beginning, we've had these two in the earth. So let's notice what we see in Revelation. We see in Revelation 9 that God intends for men by their, his punishment and plagues that he sends that they might give up their hope and their confidence in the wealth and riches and things of this life. Revelation 13, 4. It says, And they worshiped the dragon. Now who's the dragon? That's Satan. They worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. Now, how is it that they worshiped the dragon? Because most people, uh, if you tell them anything that sounds anything like they're worshiping Satan, they will be very angry with you. Now, there's a few fringe groups uh, who will openly and admittedly say that's what they're doing. But most people who are involved in worship of some sort, they get very angry if you say anything about uh, that this could be worshiping Satan. So how does the dragon get worship? Does the dragon come right out and say, hey, I'm the dragon, you should worship me? Of course not. He's a deceiver. He's subtle. He's not going to get worship. And I want you to just think about this with me because we're going to see it on play through this chapter. But it starts out with worship of the dragon. But the worship of the dragon is really by extension because it says they worshiped what? The beast. Well, who is it that gives the beast his power and his seat and authority? It's the dragon. So the dragon sets up the beast. 
which is the Antichrist and his kingdom. So if the dragon sets up this man and his kingdom and gives him his seat and power and authority, to worship him is what? To worship the dragon. So let's, let's follow this through. How did they worship? It says they worshiped the beast saying. You see that? So this is going to demonstrate the, an aspect, a very important aspect of the worship that people are offering to the beast. They say this, who is like unto the beast? Now that statement is reserved for God because he is the only one who's unlike everyone. Make sense? God is the only being who is unlike everything else that's made. So they're ascribing this greatness to the beast because they're impressed. They're impressed, right? So they say, who's like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Again, ascribing strength to the beast. Now we all know that the beast is a man. Now, how many of you know some men? Are they that great? No, there's this weird thing that happens in the world when men are made to be larger than life. And it appears that they have power and authority and wisdom and intellect and all these things but yeah, we know if you just sit down to dinner with any other guy, he's just a man. There's nothing that special. So the world has a way of conjuring up this facade to disguise what a man really is. But those of us who know the truth, we know that we're told not to think of any man above that which is written. Well, if I go to the word of God and read about men, how much should I think about men? The, the Bible says every man's a vain show. Okay, don't think anything of, above a man other than what is written. Right? So it teaches us a lot about how we should think about men because they're created beings. Right? So they're ascribing all this greatness, ascribing all this power. And in the text, we see that that is the manner of worship. That's the manner of worship that they're as they're thinking and looking at this man, they're so impressed. And by the way, it's the impression they have of his strength and power that's going to lead them ultimately to put their confidence in him. But the Bible says, cursed is the man that trusts in man. Right? So there's, there's real problems here. Uh, so there was giving him a mouth, speaking great things and all these other things. Now let's go on down through the chapter. Verse number 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall, what? Worship him. That means all that dwell on the earth. Now that's a what? A universal affirmative. That means everyone. And then there's an exception clause added that says... Uh, all shall dwell upon the earth, all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. In other words, the elect. As Christ talks about, if it were possible, even the very elect would be deceived. Notice what he then says If any man have an ear, let him hear. See, this all, it all is uh, together as an aspect of worship. What did we say this morning? You are what you worship. You worship silver and gold and, and those kind of things. The judgment of God then towards you is to make you like unto them. Unable to see, unable to hear, unable to understand. Right? So this all works together. So this is the condition that everyone will find themselves. They're all impressed by the beast. They all worship the beast. In other words, they, uh, they bow to him as, as the authority and the power they perceive in him. And they yield to his will right this is really the at the heart of worship when abram 
says, I and the lad will go yonder and worship. What is he saying? We're going to go over there and I'm, we're going to yield to the will of God that he has shown us. And we're going to go and, and once we're done with that, we'll come back, right? So the whole idea of worship uh, all through scripture carries with it that same idea. Verse number 12. And there's an, another beast that comes up, the false prophet. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, which is the Antichrist kingdom and causes the earth and then which dwell therein to what to worship the beast so let's have this other beast come up and i know prophetically we, it's interesting to get into some of this but tonight i'm not trying to do that so much as just talk about this aspect of worship and how it keeps coming up all through scripture but here at the end uh, when we have this uh, revelation given by jesus christ to john we see this kind of final climax of this competition for worship. And so this other uh, beast comes up and causeth all. So while at first everyone was impressed with the beast and they worshiped, now we have another beast come along and says, yeah, everybody else better get with the program if you're not sure, because this is the direction we're going with this thing, right? So then this beast causeth everyone to do what? To worship by means of force right so worship is now required upon your life anybody think uh, nebuchadnezzar's image right we've got an old testament foreshadowing uh, of this exact event in history that's going to come on all the world so he causes them to worship verse number 15 and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the be the image of the beast should be killed, right? So what's that? What's that issue there again at the end of that verse? Worshiping the what? Not the beast. The image. Interesting, right? So we have the dragon, and he sets up his man, and people worship the man. Then the false prophet, he goes a step further and says, "Hey." Some of you might have reservations about worshiping the man, but they're going to create this image. Now, I don't know what's going to be involved with this image thing, but you can kind of see where technology is going uh, and maybe get a little bit of a glimpse of maybe perhaps some of the technology that may even be involved with this image that we can make with our own hands, right, that can actually speak and talk. And it's so intelligent and it's much smarter than we are. Who knows? But this is where it's all going. So now we say, well, we'll just worship the image. Because look how impressive it is. Look how magnificent it is. So anyways, you just kind of see this passing of the buck, so to speak. It says the dragon's putting the beast out here to be worshipped. The beast himself kind of puts the image out there and says, worship the image. But ultimately, to worship the image is to worship the beast. And to worship the beast is to worship the dragon. Do you see that? So... At the end of the day, no matter how deceptive the de deceiver tries to be with getting worship for himself, at the end of the day, the only way to know who you're worshiping is to know the truth. <laughs> if, you know, if you're, uh, if you're so impressed, because listen, if COVID didn't show us anything, it showed us this, that when people feel threatened, they will bend over backwards to find someone who can make them safe. How do you think the Antichrist is going to come to power anyway? He's going to be promising peace and safety. The world is going to be looking for a deliverer who can guarantee them some things. That's what people want who've not believed the promises of God and Christ concerning the world to come. Say, I want some guarantees. I want some safety. And I'll give anything. You want me to bow down and worship some stupid image? fine that's great i get the little thing right because i get the little thing that's gonna make sure i can buy and sell and get my universal basic income and i can feed my family because that's the most important thing to me the most important thing to me people will tell you more than you realize if you listen to the words they use what is the most important thing to you ultimately the most important thing to you is what you worship it is what you worship now we can all say it's this and that but it's 
ultimately the decisions we make and as it pertains to the choices of our life are directly related to this concept of worship right who is worthy right who is has the worth uh, of you putting your trust and your confidence in so now they're worshiping the image and this all goes on down through we see revelation 14 6 through 7 that the everlasting gospel is being preached on the earth and people are being uh, commanded to fear God, give glory to him, and to worship him that made the heaven and earth and sea and fountains of waters. Right? Again, calling men to repentance. What is uh, the truth of worship? Who should we be worshiping? And we get all the way to the end of Revelation uh, and we can see uh, that John is even told ultimately these two words, worship God. Revelation 14, 9 gives us the final um, destiny. I think it's Revelation 14, 9. I might have put the uh, might have put the verse down wrong. Revelation 14, 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man what? Worship, Worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead and, or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. Who what? Worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name again this idea of worship it just goes front to back all the way through the word of god ultimately as we read through the book of revelation we see the climax of this uh this tale that is told for, to us over the past six thousand years of this battle of worship that has been taking place ultimately brought to a head in the earth during the time of tribulation whenever the beast uh, puts himself forth as God and demands worship and many will be swept away in the throes of that deception because they're looking for deliverance but in their mind deliverance means this life and that is the distinction the distinction between the gospel of Jesus Christ and every other promise that every other deceiver has made is that they will talk to you about this life and jesus christ is talking about something much different right? much different that speaks to everything beyond this age so much so that the testimony of god's people in the book of revelation is that they loved not their lives unto the death why because they're worshiping god but what do we learn from the old testament figure of uh hananiah mishael and uh, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. What do we learn from, from those three Hebrew children, as they're called? That while the world may try to seize an opportunity to throw us or them into the fires of destruction, that which God has promised to preserve cannot be destroyed. Amen. So we are left with our hope in Christ, just as Paul says, that he will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom you get all the way through hebrews chapter number 12 and down at the very end of the chapter paul's even talking about the removal of this present world and he says therefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved because it's not of this world right so that is the distinction the defining characteristic of the gospel of jesus christ and so many other would-be deliverers uh, that ultimately are, are represented um, in the pinnacle of the Antichrist, which is the greatest deceiver who's going to uh, visit us through the course of human history, be worshipped as God, only to be confronted by God himself. And then, of course, in the brightness of his glory, uh, it's not even a match. Um, the man who esteems himself to be God. So worship is a big deal. Is that what we learned today? 
That's what, that's what I wanted us to think about today. Worship is a big deal. It's a privilege. It's an honor. It's sacred. Uh, being made so by Christ himself. It's holy. And it should be treated as such. So we, uh, we're we grateful for our Lord and Savior and for the work he did to make uh, this congregation possible, right? That there would even be a reason to meet, a reason to congregate, a reason to be joined together. And so we're thankful to him. And whenever we do get together, it's an opportunity to let him know that uh, and to appreciate all that he's done for us. Amen.